BC listeners. That's you, by the way. Now, as well as listening to us on the radio, you can watch us on Global Player and on LBC's YouTube, Facebook and Twitter feeds. If you'd like to take part in the show and ask our panel a question, all you have to do is pick up the phone and dial 0345 6060 973. The lines are open now. All previous episodes of the programme are on the Cross Question podcast and this show will appear there before midnight. It's time to introduce our panel in the studio with me in Westminster and socially distanced are the Secretary of State for Wales and Conservative MP for Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire, Simon Hart, and West Streeting, Labour's Shadow Schools Minister and Labour MP for Ilford North. In our Leicester Square studio, we have former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah, and joining us from her East Renfrewshire constituency, it's the Deputy Westminster Leader of the SMP, Kirsten Oswald. Well, welcome to you all. Let's crack on and go to our first question. It is from Eric in Glasgow. Eric, very good evening to you. What would you like to ask our panel? Good evening. Given how contagious the coronavirus is, should the vaccine be made mandatory? What's treating? Well, I think one of the big challenges we've got at the moment is the huge amount of conspiracy theorist rubbish that's circulating on the internet and really beginning to take hold. Um, I would actually prefer not to start this conversation with the public by saying it ought to be mandatory uh, but actually having a serious conversation with the country about how essential this vaccine is how important it is that it has widespread coverage and how it will undermine everything we've tried to achieve during this pandemic if we don't have that universal coverage uh, no one um, you know we've got, gone through this before with anti-vaxxers Compu no one really wants to do compulsion on vaccines uh, but there is a huge risk to um, the economy to the country society at large and we can't allow it to go on so i hope that people will do the right thing knowing it's the right thing to do not just for, the, for their own health and the health of their families and communities but for the good of the country as a whole it's quite difficult to imagine how you would make it mandatory i mean you, you know physically force people into the, the cubicle way where you have to to do well it. exactly and i think the danger is it actually reinforces some of the dangerous conspiracy theorist nonsense that's circulating when actually um to be honest i think people will be clamoring for the vaccine if it's as successful as, as, as it appears to be and we hope it will be um government needs to get its hands on as many vaccines as possible to get them out you know obviously starting with the priority cases as the government suggested it, it will but we need to get as many of these vaccines out into the community and as widespread coverage as quickly as possible um kirsten oswald yeah i'm not um going to suggest that we should be uh, forcing people to have vaccinations but i can't emphasize enough how important i think it would be for people to take up the opportunity to be vaccinated this has been an incredibly difficult time for people all, all over Scotland, all over the, the UK and, and the world. And one of the only ways that we, we can see going forward to try and get out of this terribly difficult situation is by and um, through the development of vaccines. So if we have the opportunity to, to make life that bit more normal, to make things uh, a little bit better and allow people to, to go back to meeting with friends and family, to, to go back into their workplaces, I, I think that we should really grasp that opportunity with both hands. And one of the things that will be incumbent upon us all as, as politicians is to make sure that we explain clearly to people the, the benefits of vaccination, to explain why we're recommending that people pursue a particular course of action. I think Nicola Sturgeon's been really very good at that, coming out every day with this thoughtful and considered advice and update that she's giving. And that sort of dialogue with the public will be absolutely critical as we go forward. I think it does give us some hope that we'll need, actually, to see the, the, the development of uh, such positive news about vaccines and I hope that we continue to hear good news on that front. How do you answer people who say, well, hang on a minute, most vaccines are tested for five or ten years before they're given regulatory approval. This has only obviously been in development for a year now. Um, I'm not confident about taking this because it hasn't been trialled enough. How do you answer that point? I think that's important. We do have to have mature and respectful dialogue with people. And we have to look at what the scientific evidence says. We, you know, we have to be very clear uh, about what the, the vaccine is doing, about how it works. Uh, we also have to be quite thoughtful about how we plan any kind of rollout too. So, you know, we do have to make sure that we're treating people with the, uh, the you know, uh, treating people as adults, giving them that, that respect and having that dialogue. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, you say that um, most vaccines take five or ten years to be developed. And I know that's true. 
Uh, we don't have five or ten years with the best will in the world here, but what we do have is uh, an absolute responsibility to make sure that the science is right um, and to make sure that we, we probe to ensure it is. But I do, as I said, really welcome the prospect that we may have some, some good news, uh, okay. which I think we all need. Um, Simon Hart, what, what are people in Wales in your constituency saying to you about this? Because I imagine many politicians, their inboxes are being filled up, I imagine, at the moment with people concerned about this. Yeah, I, th I think I should start really by agreeing uh, absolutely with sort of Wes's uh, uh, interpretation of events. I absolutely subscribe to that. I think there's one element in addition to what's been said that we should add. It, it is beholden on us to explain to people that the safety tests are the safety tests. Nobody's reducing the uh, the standards which producers are expected to reach uh, in the manufacture and distribution of this uh, vaccine. So the standards are the standards. So people should be reassured that just because the time scale has been short, because there's been a massive amount of uh, money thrown into it, a huge global effort, that doesn't mean that the final product is going to be in any way uh, 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 risky. The, the tests are the tests. I think in, in, in terms of the um, reaction I'm getting from, from constituents at, at, at home, it's absolutely as you would expect, enthusiastic welcome, a tiny glimmer of light at the end of a very long tunnel, people really keen to take their responsibilities seriously, to get uh, at, at the, in their, you know, get their place in the queue so that they can uh, uh, join the national effort to defeat this thing. And of course, and, and I don't know if this is the same in Scotland, I imagine it is, it is important of course, so there's an absolutely even UK-wide uh, distribution that there isn't uh, accidentally some kind of distortion between uh, the four nations. That's really important too. So you know, I think people are keen to do this. I mean, the, the government have published, and presumably this is on um, scientific and medical advice, a, a, li a priority list of who's going to get it first and um, sort of a league table. Why haven't they included a category for um, black and minority ethnic people? Because it seems clear from the evidence so far that uh, they are more likely to contract coronavirus. Should, should, there, not, should there not have been um, a category separately? Well, I think the... Is as far as I recall from the list, uh, it's quite wide-ranging. Um, it, it is very much uh, uh, based on vulnerability. Uh, I don't think there is anything suspicious in that. I think it's been a result of very careful thought. It is going to be administered through the NHS, and there's going to be a lot of clinical input uh, into the way in which this is rolled out. But I think that uh, th the very good news about this is I think we've got, uh, notwithstanding some of the setbacks which we've experienced so far, we have got some real progress at long last and uh, we've got access to a sufficient quantity of these vaccines hopefully that we'll be able to start that rollout safely covering all of the vulnerable uh, groups uh, including you know everyone that we could uh, possibly come up with this on this program and starting that pretty soon okay sam Lashar, you're a communications professional are politicians the right people to be selling this vaccine as safe um if you were still in government what would you be advising them to do I think the important thing to remember is, let's go back to the original question, should it be compulsory? No, it shouldn't. But in order for people to be able to have the confidence to take this up, what's important that at every stage of the vaccine of the vaccination rollout, um, there is proper communication as to the effectiveness of it. So you talk about uh, BAME people who have, um, who's shown to have a tendency to contract this virus and suffer from it uh, more deeply than uh, other people. We need to be able to see what the effectiveness is for particular physiologies and individuals and at every stage as I say have some confidence that when that uh, vaccine is being tested the results and the effects are being publicly available so researchers and academics can actually assess it much more widely so I think that would be my advice politicians aren't wrong to be the people who are fronting this because it is ultimately their decisions that are bringing these vaccinations forward um, but I think it should be alongside that openness to give people, specialists and experts, uh, the opportunity to be able to assess what is actually happening with the vaccine when it comes out and when it's being used. Uh, I was interviewing a GP from Newham earlier on and I sort of jokingly suggested, but actually thinking about it, I think it was quite a good suggestion, that the government actually should do a major TV advertising campaign and get Dame Judi Dench or Sir David Attenborough to, to, to front it. People that everybody trusts because no matter what politician you get in front of a camera, there will always be, um, with greatest respect to our three political <laughs> colleagues here, there will always be people who say, well, I'm not, I don't trust a word they say. Whereas 
because there are national treasures out there, if we look hard enough, that could actually do a really good communication. Well, you could do it, job. Ian. Thank you very much, Wes. <laughs> well, I could do to, a double, head, double, head with James, <laughs> double head with James O'Brien. How about that? <laughs> But I mean, seriously, do you, do, you, do, you think, do you think that is something that ought to be looked at? Yes, certainly. But I think before you do that, you know, if you if you get a national treasure in the form of Dame Judy Jet Dench, that's wonderful. But that would be covering a particular age range. So you would need a wide variety of national treasures, celebrities, whoever you want to term it. Um, however, I you can want to come up it. with a top ten list. If do you want, like. I mean, why don't we go through it? <laughs> you know, looking at all the different groups that are affected, <laughs> and you know how how the vaccine is going to work out for them. But they all have to have had the vaccine. So hopefully, they all yeah. would trust it and haven't been uh, sold uh, down the river by yeah, these anti-vax campaigners. That would be really bad, wouldn't it, if a celebrity <laughs> fronted the campaign and it turned out that they actually haven't <laughs> had the test. Um, I'm not sure that would be a good look. Um, just before we go to a break, let me just read you some breaking news. At around 6.58 this evening, a vehicle collided with the police station officer, Edmonton Police Station. A man, no further details have been given, has been detained in connection with the incident. The vehicle remains at the scene. Specialist officers are in attendance while it is examined and at this stage uh, according to the police they've not been informed of any injuries. London Ambulance Service and London Fire Brigade are present and the police station has been evacuated and a large police cordon is in place. We'll bring you more on that uh, when and if we get Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC It's 17 minutes past 8 on LBC um, let's go to Rayan, who's in Harrow. Hello, Rayan. Hi, Ian. Hi, what, what would you like to ask? So I would like to ask um, the panel, how should England respond to Wales' decision to cancel the exams um, this academic year? And um, what should the English government do in order to ensure that both fairness and consistency is maintained amongst all the university applicants and the students applying this year? Um, Ryan, thank you for that. Before I come to our panel, though, I just want to cross um, to Mike Hughes, our reporter, who's got more on this situation in Edmonton. Mike. Yeah, Ian, quite limited information coming through at the moment, although we have had an update from the Metropolitan Police uh, just at the top of the hour. What we do know is that just before 7 o'clock tonight, um, we're told a vehicle collided with the police station office at Edmonton Police Station. Now, there, are, there is video on social media of um, what appears to be a man being detained on the ground. The Metropolitan Police have confirmed that a man... No further details other than that has been detained in connection with this incident. Um, the vehicle is still at the scene. We're told specialist officers are in attendance and are examining that vehicle. Um, the police say that at this stage, there's no um, confirmed injuries as far as they are aware. But we do know that the London Ambulance Service and the London Fire Brigade are at the scene and the police station has been evacuated. A large police cordon is in place at the moment. Now, as I say, limited detail coming in as it stands. There is nothing just yet to seemingly suggest that this is a deliberate incident. It will no doubt be a line of inquiry for officers, given that there is a, a heightened tension at the moment, certainly since uh, the, what we've witnessed um, in France and Austria in the past few weeks and of course the raising of the terror threat level in the United Kingdom as well off the back of that. As I say, nothing to suggest just yet that this is a deliberate incident but certainly an ongoing situation in Edmonton as it stands. Okay, Mike, thank you very much indeed. That's Mike Hughes there. Uh, let's go back to Rayan in Harrow. Rayan, just repeat your question for us, would you please? Of course. So to do with the, the academic situation in Wales, I'd like to ask the panel, um, how should England respond to Wales' decision to cancel the exams this year? And what should the English government do in order to ensure that both fairness and consistency is maintained amongst all the university applicants and students applying this academic year? Simon Hart. Secretary yeah, of State for Wales, I should remind yeah, you. We were, I have to say, we were quite surprised by the Welsh Government announcement. Did they not consult you? 
Uh, no, not on this occasion, I'm afraid. But they're not obliged to, to be fair. Uh, and uh, But it does seem odd when uh, the question, quite rightly, um, sort of revolves around uh, fairness across the whole of the UK, not just fairness in individual nations. And I think it was we were surprised that this early in the process that that decision was taken, uh, just on the same day, pretty well, as the first glimmers of hope around a vaccine uh, became public. And the reaction uh, from parents in Wales has been one of some dismay, confused, not quite certain well, what, the, what, the science is, so quite what the science is uh, uh, behind it. And just wanting to know that there is an evidential base. And I think these things are always much easier to explain if you can rely on some really clear evidence, which will demonstrate that kids won't be disadvantaged as a result of this, uh, uh, this policy decision by Welsh Gov, uh, and particularly kids which might be more uh, challenged than others. That would be, that would be a, a a significant own goal. So I think, to answer the question about what UK government should do, stick to its guns on this. Policy is quite clear, trying to build in some additional delays into the system next year so that those really important objectives and tests can be met, uh, And uh, but rather than just try and sort of copycat do you, each other. Do you not think, though, as Secretary of State for Wales, you should have at least been tipped off about this or consulted about this. I mean, it does seem a little odd when you, you have the title well, Secretary of State for Wales, but clearly on you, this kind of thing, you, you don't have any influence. You pushed me into an area which I was sort of sort of attempting to avoid. Because over the last five <laughs> months, there has been do. almost a weekly uh, debate about, uh, you know, has UK government engaged Welsh government sufficiently? And uh, we are constantly being accused of not having done that, even though I stopped counting after 150 meetings with the Welsh Gov around COVID uh, uh, response and economic responses. You know, I, I think there were four the weekend, just in the one weekend before last. So I think the, uh, the the cooperation and collaboration has actually been pretty extensive on this and a range of other issues. However, I do sort of think that the well, opposite, it clearly hasn't the opposite it, should be the case. It. The opposite should be the case, and I do I do think it is a bit one-sided. I, I'd like to think we do cooperate sometimes with not a lot of notice. I accept that, but on these kind of announcements, which have got cross-border implications and UK-wide implications, I think some early early sight of that would have helped us help them. And, and have you phoned Mark Drakeford and informed him of your view on that? We speak uh, more frequently than Mark Drakeford would care to admit, uh, and we do raise these issues, yes. Uh, but have you specifically on this? I haven't specifically on this, but I can tell you on all of the other uh, differences of opinion, uh, we do speak quite regularly. But what it highlights during COVID, uh, I think, is a crying desire by 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 residents and voters either side of the border for the two governments or four governments as it is if you take the whole UK to operate to put down our political weaponry just for now and operate collegiately so that the nation can have a really clear indication of direction of travel this business of a slightly nuanced policy which more often than not seems to be based in just political difference uh, is really frustrating for businesses it's really frustrating for parents it's really frustrating for teachers because nobody quite White knows uh, who's right and who's wrong, and as a result of that, compliance becomes a much bigger challenge. And we've always said, if there are if there's evidence to support regional differences, that's fine. There's not a problem. But if it looks like it's just being done because you know it's one administration, one side of the border, and one the other, it may be you know political fun and games, but if you're trying to run a business, or say, or, or run your school in a, in a cross-border area, we've got a long and porous border in Wales, it's really frustrating. Are, are you saying this is a bit of a political decision? Who knows? Because we weren't consulted and because we weren't told and because we actually don't really know what the background to it is, uh, it is very difficult not to occasionally reach that conclusion, and particularly over timing. Why now? Uh, uh, um, Kirst, Kirsten Oswald, um, if I can come to you, um, what about the fairness issue here? Because um, there are people in Wales who are going to think that their kids might be disadvantaged in seeking university places, for example, um, or jobs. If they're up against someone from England who has taken the exams, um, they could be disadvantaged. What, what, what do you make of that argument? I think that it's absolutely incumbent upon all governments to make sure that the arrangements they put in place for young people are both appropriate and robust. So, um, the you know the, the Welsh government, who I certainly am here to speak for, but I you know I, I would imagine that uh, just like the the Westminster government and the governments in Northern Ireland and Scotland will be looking at this from the perspective of what is best for the young people, what is fairest for them, what is appropriate 
how do they protect the education and the quality of the qualifications that they will come out with, as well as protecting the pupils, the, the teachers um, and, and the families that are associated with the schools. I do think that um, Simon has somehow or somewhat misunderstood how some of the uh, devolution arrangements work. So um, in Scotland, for instance, we have an entirely different and um, unique um, system of education, um, including completely different curriculum, completely different exams, completely different term dates. Um, so the decisions which are made in Scotland, for instance, are made for the benefit of the pupils and the families there. Um, that's really important. It has to be and it is the, the priority of our government in Scotland to make the best decisions for our young people. So we have said that we will not uh, continue with our National 5 exams, but we will um, plan to continue with our higher and advanced higher exams. But at the moment, all options are on the table. And I think that that is a, a very sensible and pragmatic way that that's been approached by John uh, Stoney, the, the, our the, minister. The, I think all governments the, have to be pragmatic in this. The Welsh Government say that they, they want certainty, and you can certainly understand why, given the uncertainty of what happened over the summer in terms of exam results, um, Simon says, well, this, has been, this decision may have been made a bit too early, but at least Welsh students know exactly what now confronts them. Now, in Scotland, you've got a slightly awkward system, as I understand it, where the... Na is it the nationals? Is that what they're called? The, the, the equivalent... Of I don't think it's awkward. It might be different from the English system, which well, I don't well, understand. Well, let me... Well, but, uh, let, let, me, let, me let me explain. Well let me explain, because, uh, as I understand it, the, the national exams, the GCSE equivalents, have been cancelled, but the hires have not. Wouldn't it be better to just do one or the other? Um, no, I, I don't think so. And I'm a, I can speak not only as an MP, but as a parent of uh, a child who is at that stage um, in his school career. So I have a couple of kids in secondary school here in East Renfrewshire. And I can see from a you know a very close perspective uh, the way that this is working. And I, I'm really pleased with the way that it's working. I feel very grateful to the teaching staff and the, the school management, actually. So for our National 5 exams, and they're maybe not that far away from GCSEs, is, as I say, a different system entirely, but uh, these exams will be based, or these qualifications will be based upon the attainment of the children within the school. So they'll still have a, a structured and rigorous um, curriculum okay. to go through, but it will be assessed differently. For our higher and advanced higher qualifications, which are you know, the kind of qualifications you would use for university entry. It is still the plan for these to be undertaken in a normal exam um, situation, but we're keeping all options on the table. And I think that that is sensible because as we've learned over the, the past number of months, it's very difficult at any time to see what is around the corner. But we do have plans in place so the teachers and the schools are ready for whatever actually comes to pass over the winter period. And I think that the, the, okay. the pupils are pretty happy with that. Um, Mark C on Twitter says, for God's sake, Dale, whenever they say Dale, you know something <laughs> bad is coming. Uh, Westminster is so arrogant and non-communicative and you're putting the blame on Wales. Wake up and smell the coffee. I wasn't putting the blame on anyone. I was asking Simon Hart, as is my role. Um, Salma Shah, what do you make of this? Well, Dale, I think my view of this is going to be really <laughs> simple, which is, you know, if you take the politics out of it... Um, this policy is devolved and the Welsh government, just as the Scottish government, have a right to make their decisions as they see fit and they are accountable to uh, their electorate for that. I think Simon has a point in terms of the politicking of it. Now, we don't know whether this is sort of designed to... to be politicised the issue, and I and I would well, hope that it's not. Bear, bear in mind, Salma, that the liberal that the Welsh Education Minister is a Liberal Democrat, not not a Labour uh, cabinet member. But it might also be the case that it, it's about sort of creating dividing lines within the Welsh Assembly. I mean, the the, the issue of politicising certain issue uh, for certain issues um, can exist. We don't know definitively whether it's about sort of attacking Westminster or or anything else. I think the problem is, and where Simon is right, and I would agree is the consultation with the Westminster government just as a matter of courtesy is important because we are in a pandemic situation and obviously learning from one another and, and what is the science that's driving this is important. So I think you know we can make we can make a, a big issue about you know kind of like is Westminster going to follow what Cardiff is doing and then what's going to happen in Edinburgh but really it's got to be about having that um, trust within um, within governments and being able to talk to each other and 
if you decide to do something differently, knowing that you have something that backs that up and should Westminster need to do it, being able to have that information and sharing that information and saying, okay, this is perhaps something that we need to now look at before we get to the summer. But it isn't a foregone conclusion that just because Cardiff has done something that Westminster should then try and chase and and get ahead of the issue. Um, So whatever reason the Welsh Government has decided um, to do this, it would be really helpful, I think, even behind the scenes for them to be transparent about it with the Westminster Government. Um, Shadow Schools Minister was treating it. If you were in government at the moment, would you not expect to have been consulted by the Welsh Government about this? Well, if you're Gavin Williamson, you're notionally at least the Secretary of State for Education in England. We don't see or hear much of him. Um, Well, well, he's got the title, let's put it that way. (laughs) Politics aside, first and foremost, this is about pupils. Politics aside, this is about. (laughs) (laughs) No, Aaron. I look Dale. No, Aaron. Don't don't, don't don't put me on Twitter. I'm going to have have to provoke Kirsten. First first and foremost, you know, joking aside, first and foremost, This is about pupils who desperately need certainty about what kind of assessments they're facing later this year. Lots of them have missed out on huge chunks of schooling throughout the year and they are really worried and anxious. And their teachers and head teachers are worried and anxious because they don't believe that the status quo would work whether they are teaching in England, Wales or Scotland, which is why every one of those governments has to be clear with teachers, schools, parents and pupils about what the arrangements are going to be. The government in England has made it very clear that exams are going to go ahead. We believe it is better for exams to go ahead for all sorts of reasons, not least maintaining fairness. But no one believes, surely, that we could make young people, whether GCSEs or A-levels, sit exams with the same papers, assuming they've had the same curriculum covered during this disruption. Of course they haven't. So let's put a plan A in place that means that there's greater options within exam papers, maybe fewer exam papers sat, but we've got a plan there in place that teachers can teach to now. Secondly, let's make sure that if pupils miss an exam because they're having to self-isolate through no fault of their own, that we have backup papers. And thirdly, let's take into account the enormous regional variation uh, between those regions that have been plunged into chaos because of COVID-19 and those who fared better and make sure that when it comes to marking and moderation that we're taking into account the relative disadvantage that pupils have placed. That would be a great plan A. Plan B should be if worse comes to the worst and we can't have exams, let's not end up with the last minute debacle we have we had last year. Let's make sure that we've got a backup plan in place for um, centre assessed grades or similar uh, if, we, if we get there. At the moment what worries me about England is there is no plan A or plan B. We can debate the Welsh Government's position, we can debate the Scottish Government's position. At the moment the English Government's position is a three-week delay and that is not going to help anyone. Quickly, well, Simon. very yeah, r- really quick question. I think it's um, uh, at the moment we are having very constructive uh, dialogue and conversations with all four nations of the UK about what to do over the Christmas period. It proves it, as far as students are concerned, t- travelling and to and from home, that it proves that it can work. So actually, the, there's 100 percent cooperation on that. If there can be over Christmas travel and Christmas arrangements, there can be on these other issues too. Okay, um, we will cross question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.38. Let me reintroduce my panel. Secretary of State for Wales is here, Simon Hart, West Streeting, Shadow Schools Minister. Kirsten Oswald is Deputy Westminster Leader of the SNP. And Salma Shah, Communications Specialist, former Special Advisor to Sajid Javid at the Treasury. Uh, You can watch us if you'd like to, as well as listen to us on Global Player, the LBC YouTube, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Uh, Let's go to our next caller. It's Anthony in Staines. Hi, Anthony. What would you like to ask? Yes, and good evening, Ian. Hi. Good oh, evening. My Daniel. question is, Excellent. could the emerging uh, anti-lockdown movement cause a political political earthquake similar to that we saw with Brexit? Um, Kirsten Oswald, what, what do you think of that? Because the, the, in Germany, for example, there have been massive demonstrations. Here, not so much. Yeah, not, not so much. Um, I, I certainly hope not, and I don't think that that's the the direction of travel. It's undeniable that this is a really hard time for for everyone, for all of us. Nobody wants to be subjected to the the kind of measures that we're all having uh, to, to live under at the moment. But ultimately, these really extraordinary measures are only in place because 
governments are trying to protect the population from this terrible disease. So I think that most people understand that. I think that there are some really key issues in there. I think that communication is so important. It's so vital that we are absolutely on top of letting people know at all times what is happening, why it's happening, what the logic is, what the evidence is for the, these really uh, challenging measures that we could have never foreseen in the past. And, I, you know, I, I know that I, I mentioned this earlier, but I must go back to the, the daily briefings that Nicola Sturgeon gives, because whatever people's political views, people are tuning in because it is so difficult at the moment and so important for people to understand what's happening and I think that in that kind of challenging environment one of the the ways that we make sure that, that we don't have the difficulties that your caller has described is to be upfront, to be open, to be transparent and to be very accessible and I think as we go through the, the winter period which, which is going to be hard then that's going to be ever more important. Salma? I mean simply no, I don't believe it to be the case. And I think it's really odd to have something that is based in science and fact, which is essentially a pandemic. However, we might have differences about, you know, certain evidence bases around the science to try and politicise that sort of lockdown versus not lockdown and make it this sort of cultural issue. Yes, absolutely. There are trade offs in terms of keeping the economy open and keeping people safe. But that is not sort of a dividing line of a political question. Question. And I think it's I think it's preposterous. And I and I hope and I believe that given people's compliance with lockdown, with the sensible measures that have been taken, with the fact that this particular lockdown is lighter, if you like, than than the one that began in March, um, that actually there there are you know sensible measures that are taken to to mitigate uh, mitigate against you know essentially very extreme views about whether we should be locked down or not. So simply no, I don't I don't think we're going to have some kind of fundamental backlash and it sort of suggests that Brexit was just born out of um, you know a, sort of a whim over single issues rather than the fact that it was you know a, an issue that was creeping up for decades and decades so I don't think the two things are comparable um, Well Streeting what, what, what do you think of this because you, we've got Nigel Farage reforming mm. the Brexit party into a vaguely anti-lockdown party you, you've got um, talk show presenters cutting up face masks live on in, in vision which was clearly premeditated mm. um, do, do you think this could get out of hand? Nigel Farage started this pandemic by attacking the government. He started for, the pandemic. Well, no, started. Well, no, <laughs> Nigel yes. Farage started out in this pandemic by criticising the government for following a herd immunity strategy and saying they weren't doing enough. Now he's seen a political opportunity. He wants to exploit the pain and suffering of the country to try and mount a political comeback. The radio presenter you mentioned, who, to whom we shall not refer, because not least they're on a rival station. That was entirely performative and Depends designed... Depends on your definition of designed, rival. Well, indeed, Ian. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, it's, it was designed to court controversy, gain publicity and clickbait on social media. Let's put them to one side and let's put the um, anti-vaxxers and the conspiracy theorists to one side. The thing that I am worried about is that there are lots of people who are really suffering at the moment, um, economically, particularly with their jobs, and lockdown is really painful for them. And I think it's really important that they feel that their voice and their concern is heard in Parliament and that we're not just kind of steamrolling over them. And there isn't just this divine wisdom at the top of politics that says, we don't care about you, we're trampling over you, we've just got to do it in the national interest and, and screw you, leave you behind. Um, I do think those people have a voice actually on both sides of the House of Commons. There are people who've, and, and to be honest, all of us, including those of us who voted with the government on these restrictions, we really don't do this lightly. On the civil liberties front, on the jobs front and the impact on people's lives and livelihoods, we don't do any of this lightly. What we've tried to do um, in the Labour Party, and we've had our differences, and particularly where the government's deviated from the science, but by and large, we've really tried to be constructive because we know that people out in the country don't want to see us just taking lumps out of each other during a national crisis. They want to see us working together. I think we've just got to, at every stage, not be complacent about the fact that we're asking a lot of the country. It's having a real impact on people people's lives and livelihoods and we've got to justify our decisions and explain our decisions every step of the way and to those people who think we've been making the wrong decisions and going too far we've got to make sure that they understand that we're not ignoring them that we have taken on board what they're saying and these are difficult choices and trade-offs but there's a difference between
between having a different view and ignoring people completely. And given where our country's been, the divisions we've had over a number of years now, I think we've just got to try and manage our public discourse and debate in a much better way so that everyone feels listened to and heard and their points addressed, even if we part ways on, on, on um, decisions. Simon? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd start from a position, nobody uh, is, uh, is, a, is a lockdown enthusiast. Uh, we only go to get to this position because we feel there is no other than the, than the science points us to that particular position. And, and there is nobody who feels more um, distressed by having to do this than the PM uh, himself. And I think it's, it's really important that, that, you know, these decisions, as were said, are not taken lightly. They're taken after many, many hours of action. But there were 38 Tory MPs who didn't vote with the government, either voted against or, in Theresa May's case, uh, abstained on the lockdown yeah. legislation. That's true. But That's a substantial body of opinion. It, but, Parliament had, but Parliament had had its view, and the substantial, by far the majority of uh, parliamentarians voted in favour of this lockdown, with great disappointment. And by the way, that's reflected in public opinion too. Public is significantly in favour of this, equally frustrated by it, in some cases massively inconvenienced by it, uh, financially and otherwise, but recognising that it is an important part of trying to deal with the disease. Just say one other thing. Uh, when we talk about following the science, uh, it isn't just about medics. It's not just about uh, Chris Whitty and, and, and Valance. It's about behavioural science, it's about economic science too. The, the judgement call that politicians have to make, and I wouldn't sit here and say we get it right all the time, is trying to balance those three things, trying to balance public safety uh, with economic uh, opportunity and damage, and actually also what we can reasonably expect. You, uh, you, the say, public to you say you don't patient. get it right all the time. Tell me something that you've got wrong in this pandemic. <sighs> How much longer have we got? No. Um, well, I, well, I tell you what, I tell you what I think. Itself. I tell you what I think. I, I gave I gave this answer to fun enough to my son who's doing a project on this at the moment at his university, and uh, it's never say never. And I think that occasionally we have possibly uh, been almost too explicit in 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 our in our in our. Uh, saying how this thing is going to unfold and what the particular intervention measures might be. And I'm guilty of this myself, uh, and that's why I use the example. I've actually gone public quite a few times and said, right, this is the last, and we're never doing this again, or we're, this will be over by a certain date, or this is the last, you know, furlough will definitely end on a specific date, not a day longer. And I've regretted that, because actually the virus and the data tells us something different every hour, every week, every month. And to commit ourselves to, uh, uh, to, to, to not being able to be flexible as the virus creeps up and does something else is very frustrating. The other, well, that, 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 that would be my main Do, do you accept that the, this rather trite phrase that uh, Matt Hancock in particular keeps trotting out, or certainly did um, until recently, we, we've made all the right decisions at the right time, that's actually impossible. Mm. And people people well, know that that's impossible. I, I you might you aspire to make the right decisions yeah. at the right well, time, I, but you can't and do And I think that. if I'd come here, uh, you know, at the beginning of March or whatever it was, and I'd sat here and I said, by the way, uh, Ian, the way this is going to go is that every single uh, medical intervention we're going to make is going to work. Every single financial intervention is going to cover every possible eventuality uh, and, and, and then set out a whole range of uh, measures which were going to go perfectly, you would have accused me of being delusional. You would have said that's not reasonable. Of course, this is a very, very fast-changing situation. We don't necessarily know uh, as, as much about this disease as we would like. Therefore, we're going to learn as we go along and we're going to adapt our responses as we go along. And, and of course, as that's, uh, okay. as that's happened, we, 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 we might right. do certain Very things quick response from Anthony uh, to your own question. Anthony? Yes, well, we've seen the most dreadful results from COVID in the most locked down countries, including, of course, our own we've seen today. And when the treatment begins to outweigh the disease and its harmful effects, I think that this will gain legs and the public will start turning. The tide will start turning. OK, uh, Anthony, thank you very much indeed for that. We'll, as I say, bring you more on that news in Edmonton about the car that's crashed into a police station as soon as we have it. More from our panel in a moment and more from you. It's 8.48. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. Well, after nine, we're going to be talking about loneliness on LBC. We covered it in the news hour last night, but uh, this report shows that 40% of people in this country at the moment feel lonely. Are you one of them? We want to hear from you after nine. We're also going to be crossing to a reporter live at the scene at this police station in Edmonton, where a car has crashed into the police station. But let's continue with our panel on Cross Question. We have a new caller from Mel who's Melody in East Sheen. Melody, what would you like to ask? Good evening, guys. Thanks for having 
having me on. Um, so I am one of the excluded three million that fell through the cracks of government support. I work for the NHS and the police. Um, there have been four suicides and four attempted suicides that we know of in the last two weeks. Why does the government, Richie Sunak, refuse to support these desperate people who are still asking, despite them protesting that the schemes are working? If it did, we wouldn't still be campaigning. And what can you guys do to ensure that they will change this and ensure that these desperate people don't lose any more people to suicides? Um Okay, um, good question. Uh, Salman Shah, let's come to you first. You were a special advisor at the Treasury. Um, Rishi Sunak said he wanted to put his arm around everybody, but there are three million people that feel a bit unloved at the moment. I think the problem with the way that the Treasury is dealing with this at the moment is that they have one setting in terms of having had the furlough scheme, which was delivered well and covered a vast uh, majority of workers when we had the full lockdown and it was successful. I think the problem here is that with the way that the virus is moving and the way that the economy is moving around it means that they don't actually have enough of the data to be able to capture, um, you know, where people are falling through the cracks. So I don't for one second say that everything that the Treasury has done is perfect. I think they do need to have a new focus on actually understanding how the economic patterns are working and where people are not being supported. Um, they do need to make better interventions and much more targeted in interventions. As I say, the issue is that the work behind the scenes has not been done to be able to understand where that information is coming from. Now, I, again, it's not sort of Rishi Sunak's fault. It's not the Treasury's fault. It is just a consequence of the fact that they are moving incredibly rapidly um, in line with something that is constantly moving and where the evidence base doesn't really exist. But Simon Hart, HMS, HMRC have had, what, seven or eight months to look at this now. You would have thought that in that time scale, some sort of scheme could have well, been well, imagined to help people like well, Melody. I, th I think that, uh, to be fair to Rishi and the Treasury, and uh, they have made a superhuman effort not only to provide support where support is needed and i i'm by the way in relation to melody's question every mp will have examples of this i'm i'm no different i've had examples of people who've written to me in various stages of you know real distress because they fall into those gaps what the treasury has attempted to do is not only plug as many of those gaps as possible but to remain flexible now this is a it's and i'm not i know this sounds like an excuse and it's not meant to um the treasury is a big slow moving beast as we know but it has moved with remarkable speed during this uh, nine Well, it, it did on in the order to try scheme, and, but why, why not for the three million? Well, I think th th if, if Rishi was here, he would say that uh, some of the measures which have been introduced by, will, might have an indirect benefit, but I don't want to get into sort of trying to suggest for, for one minute that uh, people are, are, are making uh, uh, observations which, uh, uh, which aren't correct, because I absolutely understand, as I've seen it with my own eyes, that this, there, are, there are gaps. Mm -hmm. and, but Rishi has said all along, there's another, I think there's another statement next week, where each time he does, he's to trying to find, as, as Selma says, to try and uh, see where we've got to, see what the data says, and to see if those gaps okay. can be plugged in a timely and sensible um, fashion. I'm really sorry, it doesn't always work. Wes and Kirsten, if you could keep your answers fairly brief, I'd be grateful. I think you should invite Rishi Sunak on and do an excluded hour. I really think he needs to be confronted with the consequences of time and time and time again. Every time there's a new round of funding, every time there's a new package, a new scheme that's announced, the same group of people are excluded and left behind. There are challenges with how you target resources effectively, of course there are, but even if he had a scheme that was channeled through local authorities, uh, local authorities would be in a much better position to assess evidence from people affected, to make sure that money gets to people who need it. That would be a much better way. And, and uh, honestly, uh, uh, this has been one of the worst parts of the pandemic for me as a constituency MP in terms of talking to people <coughs> whose lives and livelihoods have been thrown into absolute chaos, the, the despair and misery they feel having been left behind and seeing support for other people which they don't resent, they don't resent that at all, but not receiving anything themselves and not since April. I, I'm, I'm 
heartbroken by those statistics that Melody just shared. Keir Starmer was asked about this on, on, on Monday morning um, on his LBC um, call-in, and he raised it with Boris Johnson today at Prime Minister's Questions. There is such a big cross-party call for action on the excluding the House of Commons, and I cannot understand for the life of me why Rishi Sunak hasn't done anything to help the three million excluded. Kirsten. I think it's, in, it's it's absolutely impossible to comprehend why nothing has happened to support these people. In Blackford, our Westminster leader uh, spoke about this at, at PMQs again today. And, your your and government could have done it in Scotland, me. couldn't they? Yeah, quite. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it, Ian. Uh, um, your government could have done come up with a scheme for Scotland, couldn't they? The, the difficulty with that theory, of course, is that the Chancellor and the Treasury hold all of the economic levers that we would dearly like to hold. So if we had the ability to pull these economic levers for ourselves, then we wouldn't have been waiting for furlough. But you do. But you do well, on, no, on no, no, we, we don't have these economic levers. These particular economic provisions are coming from the Treasury. That's what sits at Westminster as things stand. And as things stand, these three million people who have been waiting for months and months and months still see no light at the end of the tunnel. It's completely unforgivable. I don't understand what the barrier is. Um, I hope that the Chancellor does think again, but I'm concerned that he won't, given that we've gone all these months okay. down the line with no progress. Welsh Government, okay. Welsh government are sitting on a billion pounds worth well, of Well, this, this is the point, that you are allocated money from yeah. the, through the Barnet formula, through the Treasury grant, which you can spend exactly how yeah. you wish. That's how I understand this. I think, again, that's a, a misunderstanding of the... the both the devolution settlement and how the, the economics of this works. So if the Treasury is in a position to provide for a furlough, to provide for these excluded people, then that is their responsibility. We would like, as I say, to have that okay. responsibility ourselves. But as things stand, that unfortunately we, we don't. So we're reliant upon the, the Westminster government to, to right. take steps. And I would urge them to um, do that. We're, run, we're running slightly over time. I do want to finish uh, with a quick text question from Daniel in Nottingham. He says, speaking of look, Dale, I'm watching the live stream on Global Player and Simon Hart is a total dead ringer for former football manager Brian <laughs> Clough. Which famous person have the panellists been mistaken for? Well, you kind of don't need to answer that one, do you? Is there anybody else that you would like? Piers Morgan and Bruce Willis on my right are I'm interested in. You are, you are dead Piers to me, Morgan. Simon. You are absolutely dead There's to There's so much cross-party cooperation going on here, and now, now it's shattered. Um, who, who have you been mistaken for, apart from Piers Morgan? I don't know. I mean, I mean look, you can, I, I'll tell you what, you can go through my Twitter mentions, you can find all sorts of unfavourable comparisons, but I'm not going to share them with Actually, you. Bruce Willis, I'll, I'll take, because it's normally Rick Stein. Uh, Salma Shah. Oh, I don't know if I should admit this, but as an, uh, an Asian woman in Tory politics, I mean, pretty much any other Asian woman in Tory politics, I remember once, who I'm, I'm being chased through Portcullis House by a Tory MP, who I'm not going to name, um, oh, go who was shouting... Pretty, pretty, pretty. <laughs> and she'd just been selected for her seeing with them. And I turned around and he saw my face and he was like, congratulations. And I said, it's not me. <laughs> oh, go on. Who was it? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll text you later. <laughs> OK, do that. Um, Kirsten. I don't think I've ever been compared to anybody <laughs> famous. The, the nearest I've probably got is... I'm really short, which is less easy for you to tell uh, because I'm sitting down. Uh, but I'm about <laughs> a foot shorter than most of uh, the colleagues that I seem to hang around with. So uh, I am uncharitably occasionally referred to as a smurf. Um, but I'm oh. sure it's made worse things too. Uh, well, next time you're on the programme, that's given, my, given me a line for my introduction to you. Thank, <laughs> look, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, Simon Hart, Salma Shah, Kirsten Oswald and Wes Streeting. Coming up in a moment, we're going to be talking about loneliness. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, an investigation is now underway as a car has crashed into the police station in Edmonton in North London. That was just before 7 o'clock this evening. LBC's reporter Mike Hughes is at the scene. There is video on social media of what appears to be a man being detained 